That's nice. great to see. Um, well, welcome everyone. I'll jump right in. Um, today we talk with Diana Chen around product and product-led growth. Last uh, in, in last two weeks ago, we talked to Arthi about just AI and breaking into that space. So we'll continue on that trajectory. For those of you who are not familiar with Brain Trust, we are a community of 395,000 talent professionals, mostly in the tech space, globally. And so far together, we've earned $169 million through quality jobs on the platform. And two months ago, we've launched uh, an addition to the product, the professional network, where people like yourselves can get that career help, coaching, from each other, from esteemed folks like Diana, who mentor folks, and um, start upskilling, start learning. So without further ado, let me introduce Diana. Diana is a product executive and a growth enthusiast with two decades of experience driving innovation, monetization, and just positive change in Fortune 500 companies. Some of those include Lyft, Amazon, eBay, Eventbrite, she spent over a decade developing diverse, high-performance teams that build several products from zero to one, one to N globally. These businesses grew into multi-billion dollar businesses that millions of customers used. She's now the Senior Director of Product Management at Shipt, a same-day delivery service owned by the Target Corporation. Not only that, but Diana is also a leadership and career coach that is passionate about diversity and inclusion, and elevating marginal voices, helping people be the boss of their own careers. As an introversion uh, Asian woman, she has taught to remain humble and suppress her opinions with respect to the elderly or people higher in the ranks. So it took years of reprogramming in her early career to overcome some of that imposter syndrome and really stop being ashamed of self-promoting and expressing herself authentically. So by constantly embracing chances to go outside of her comfort zone, she's advanced her career and she wants to share a lot of that with you um, and folks that are starting and growing through their career. So Diana, thank you so much. So glad you're here. Thank you, Elena, for hosting me. And hi, everyone. Um, there's one little thing to add. I'm also a mom of two very young girls. Uh, and a fun fact, I actually started new jobs while I was pregnant. And so happy to share any what it's like to interview and transition into new jobs while expecting. Oh, my gosh. Somebody add that to the AMA. Yeah, Diana and I <laughs> met a couple of years back when I just had my first. And so I think we bonded over... Sure. Hey, like switching jobs during maternity leave, looking for a job when you're pregnant. It feel it feels like this taboo subject, but right. we both did it. We're both examples of it. So it was good to find somebody else who went through that. Uh, yeah. So Diana, yeah, let's start there. What are some tips for for badass moms like yourself? <laughs> well, so through career coaching, I'm surprised to meet many women who have actually shied away from seeking new opportunities while they're pregnant. I think oh, they're just nice. concerned that there would be bias in the system anyway, so it would be a total waste of time. But I do believe that you should never get in the your own way, right? So um, trying <laughs> is still worth it because um, without trying, it's 100% chances of failure. But if you try, at least there's more than 1% chance of success, right? Um, and and so, yeah, in both times, I was surprised. Like, I think with my first one, um, my biggest surprise was I was eight months pregnant when I was interviewing. And oh, wow. those were pre-COVID days. So you still had physical on-sites. <laughs> and I was surprised to still receive an offer. I honestly went in with the mindset of just wanting to practice interviewing and learning more about the opportunity. And when I received the offer, it just really spoke a lot about the hiring 
manager as well as the company who's willing to mm. receive me knowing that I would be going on maternity leave very shortly. Um, so yeah, that was actually with uh, Amazon Music. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then second one, it was more, you know, virtual. <laughs> and so I didn't even disclose I was pregnant. And then by the time, um, you know, I already got on board, started making some impact and stuff and was ready to get into my third trimester was when I actually started sharing the information like, oh, I need to prep for my maternity leave. And people were a bit shocked and surprised. They're like, we didn't even know you were pregnant. I was like, yeah, because on Zoom, you only see from the chest up. You you can't see my belly <laughs> growing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now, I remember presenting to the board uh, 40 weeks pregnant at next door and the yeah. same thing, you know, you can only see uh, shoulders up. So um, <laughs> we had a contingency plan for in case, you know, things happen. 40 weeks. Uh, wow, that's exactly. crazy. <laughs> so, yeah, hey, it can, it can all be done. Well, thank you so much for that insight, Diana. And yes, both uh, Diana and I would love to share other insights and encourage uh, folks that are applying. I mean, there's several people asking about, like, do you even apply when the market is difficult? And I find there's similarities that you don't know unless you try and you'll always learn, as Diana mentioned, uh, by by applying. Um, But with that, let's move into just product-led growth. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion are some of the critical factors for success in this approach? Yeah, I feel like um, there are three components um, that would be critical to success in product-led growth. Like one is a solid understanding of your target customers, knowing their needs, pain points, and motivations. So you could design a product that has the potential of selling itself to these customers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And then two, you need to differentiate your offering because when there's a pain point and an opportunity to go solve something, there's bound to be more than one person or company out there wanting to solve that problem. And the challenge for you is to figure out how to do it better Mm -hmm. and how to make your differentiation harder to be... I guess, followed. Um, And then the last piece, and I've come to learn that a lot more and appreciate that a lot more as I've moved from company to company, is needing a company culture that is aligned around product-led growth Mm -hmm. so that you make sure as a product manager, when you're working cross-functionally, all the efforts are going towards the same direction of fueling that product-led growth flywheel as opposed to say like you know a portion trying to drive sales-led growth while another is trying to drive product-led growth and that disjointness might end up causing nothing to work well. Yeah, I've definitely experienced that, that if there isn't that alignment from the top, you're mm-hmm. constantly fighting that uphill battle. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, we'll talk about product-led growth more um, as we start answering questions, but wanted to jump in to the just the very beginning. So the majority of our network has five years or more of experience, but there's folks that are just starting out. Um, so for your students, the folks you coach, what are some uh, suggestions you have for just getting into product management. And let me share um, our first question from from Kevin, um, who's a new grad, and he's Mm -hmm. asking, you know, especially with the mass layoffs, what are some of the things he can start doing? Mm. Yeah, that's definitely a very common question right now. (laughs) Not just for um, new college grads, but also for entry-level PMs. So it used Mm -hmm. to be that new college grads who don't have any PM experience or those in other disciplines wanting to break into product management would leverage internships or join associate product management programs to break into product management. But with the mass layoffs, uh, many companies have either cut their internship positions in the PM function or even cut APM programs altogether that I've heard of. 
So with this imbalance of like, you know, oversupply of those who want to break into product management versus you know, the actual available positions, then it makes it really difficult in this current time to mm-hmm. get into PM. And so the kinds of advice I've been giving to others is find creative ways to gain PM experience. Because that's how, you know, having actual practical PM PM experience is how you stand out amongst all the applicants versus just taking a bunch of classes. Now, it's not that classes aren't va- uh, valuable because they help you understand um, what product management is and teaches you like, you know, frameworks of how to speak and think like a PM, which are all basic needs. But when it comes to giving a hiring manager confidence that you can do the job, nothing is as good as having done the job. Right. Um, Even if it's not in a formal capacity, meaning that wasn't your job title, but you kind of voluntarily helped out your PM team. um, Mm -hmm. Although your official title is another job function. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen that. And um, I've seen people come from just different disciplines too within, uh, within the company. Uh, from operations, from data, so just finding finding ways to uh, to help out, so that you yeah. can do kind of that tour of duty. Um, something I, um, that resonates with me. Correct. And then another thing I find um, interesting that a lot of people don't think of, um, and it's because you know I started out this way in my career. I started out in consulting. And actually nowadays, and this is decades ago, right? but nowadays it's actually pretty common for consulting companies, whether it's like Accenture, Deloitte, Slalom, so, um, even um, PricewaterhouseCoopers, so on, like they actually have product management practices within right. their company. And a lot of people seeking to become a product manager just think of the traditional tech companies, whether it's like Fang or startups um, as their go-to places to apply to be a product manager, but they're not thinking of like consulting as an alternative. And even recently through networking, I found someone's at a VC firm as a product Mm -hmm. manager. So there's so many alternatives and that is where, you know, what I mean by creative ways to gain PM experience rather than thinking myopically of like the traditional way to get into product management. Yeah, absolutely. Another similarity for you and I, I've also spent time in management consulting and I think that helps with that, um, those leadership skills, like the presentations, Mm -hmm. the executive summaries that help uh, later on in your career. So I can really totally agree. Like, you know, you learn to be very versatile, um, problem solve across various industries and problem spaces. Um, and to your point, communication and leadership skills are all very key of what you learn and practice and pick up along the way um, that are very valuable and transferable as a PM. Absolutely. Um, so let's move on to just like actually landing a job. So here's a question from Ian. Uh, or just specific examples or tactics you've seen work. There's so much literature out there about the aspirational, but anything you can help Ian with here? Yeah, so I think I touched upon it a little bit earlier in the previous question, right? So you definitely need to understand what it means to be a PM um, and then speak and think like a PM to be able to pass the interview. But still like delivering results as a PM would be the best way because mm. having done the job, even in an informal capacity, whether it's voluntary through a, a formal job, or I know there are, you know, Kickstarter kind of um, projects out there. And there's even um, some sites that allow you to be a voluntary PM. Like those are all valuable experience you gain to put what you learn as a PM to practice. Mm -hmm. And then you get to see like the practicality of things. Like some of those frameworks sometimes don't work the way you anticipate. And that's where you have to adjust, right? Um, And then the other thing is, of course, network. Um, I'm surprised by how many people don't try to um, spend enough time networking, not expecting that they would get a job right away. And that's not the 
intention they should go in in terms of re- building that relationship. But relationships go a long way, and you never know when um, it would actually pay off the amount of time you invest in it, right? And so that's where you always have to plant the seed because then you get to network with more PMs and get to know like, you know, what opportunities are out there and get to learn like, you know, tips and tricks on how to get into a particular space. Um, Mm -hmm. So those are some of the more practical Mm -hmm. advice I have um, that I've seen work for people yeah absolutely I definitely go into networking from just like a learning mindset like maybe I can learn something from this person and just it's possible that I will work for this person or they will work for me in the future so really thinking through uh, that people power that you will absolutely need uh, as you progress in your career because you need to over time not only deliver your own results but those of of your team. So yeah, Yeah. really practical advice. Um, Another set of questions just around transitioning. So people coming from different disciplines, we had another person from a a QA perspective, Prachi, but Daniel here uh, sounds like he's an accomplished uh, tech lead. He's got that technical background that a Mm -hmm. lot of people are looking for, Mm -hmm. but he's looking for advice on how to now start translating some of that technical background into product experience. Yeah. So when transitioning from one discipline to the other, and I think one time I actually heard the stat in a women in product podcast where I think over 70 or 80% of PMs did not start out as a PM, including myself, right? Like I started as a consultant, right? So it's not surprising that that's a stat. Um, You have to look through what are transferable skills. Uh, We talked about communication, leadership, are all transferable skills that apply to product management as well, right? So that's how you want to reposition what your past experience Mm. was that applies to being a product manager. Now, of course, there's some skills that require you to still brush up and learn. So in this case, it seems like Daniel's very technical. And so, yes, he may have domain expertise that helped him break into product management of that particular domain. But as he transitions into that new role, he needs to kind of reprogram how he communicates and operates, given it is a different role. As Mm -hmm. a product manager, you are working cross-functionally with majority of your stakeholders being non-technical. And one of the key parts of being a PM is being very strong in communication and being able to help bridge the gap between technology and business. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be able to translate technical concepts and terms to a non-technical audience. And a good practice is to like simply try to describe what you're doing to your parents may not be technical right like if you can simplify what you do (laughs) to and what you want to convey to someone who has no context or knowledge of what you're working on then you have you know mastered what it means to be a pm and so it's really practicing with others who are you know your trusted circle And ideally, in this case, non-technical, right? You don't want to just be practicing with a bunch of other engineers, but you want to be um, practicing with some non-technical audiences to see if something that you're trying to convey is coming across clearly. I agree with that. I find that things finally start resonating when people repeat what I say in their own words, and then they start picking up on... Um, their language. So I feel like a part of a product manager's job is translation. So being this translator from design language to engineering language. Um, So yeah, I can relate to uh, Diana's feedback there. Um, Now, moving on to a question more around uh, that transformation from either a senior product manager or someone senior to a lead. How do you 
combine um, some of those technical aspects with business requirements. So here's a question from Ulads on, you know, grasping that business and customer customer needs. How do you recommend people start doing that? Yeah, so being able to grasp business and customer needs, I found the most effective way is to actually spend time with those business stakeholders and customers mm-hmm. to understand the five W's. Like, how do they think? What do they need? Why do they need it? Right. And ask, you know, going in with these like very open minds and um, learning mentality, trying to empathize and understand what's going on in their shoes will help you grasp like those requirements more. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think there's ever an alternative. I think there's, especially in larger (laughs) teams, there's, you know, researchers, there's designers, there's people who can speak to customers on your behalf, but it doesn't replace that pain of somebody actually, you know, sharing uh, what, what they need and where your product falls short for you to really get that, that urgency to fix it. Right. Yeah, that is so true. Like, yes, we can rely on your UX researchers and customer support to kind of hear through them what the summarized pain points are. But in a lot of my um, companies that I've been at, there's always been avenues for product managers to directly sit in those research sessions with Mm. the customer or perhaps even listen in on a call (laughs) into customer support so you can actually experience that pain firsthand. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's not a waste of time. It's actually going to make you aware of the customer, aware of the business, and make you a better product manager, designer, engineer, you name it. If you're building uh, software, you got to go talk to them. Yes, I totally agree. Like, yeah, not just PMs across the board. Um, I think it's very important to have that customer empathy, um, no matter what job function you're in. So, yeah, do take the time to spend time understanding your customers. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, So let's switch gears a little bit. So we talked about just breaking into product, transitioning um, and moving up that career ladder. So next um, we have a bunch of questions about just building effective products. So let's start here with with Anthony and just understanding some of that how. How do you build great products? So he starts with, can you explain the strategies or methodologies used with companies to measure and track the success of their product growth initiatives? So, I think there's a lot of key words right there that are important to touch on. Um, So it's very important to set a clear product vision and strategy up front before you get into measuring and tracking success, right? Because you need to be able to paint a clear um, vision of where you want um, the team and the product to head towards three years, five years down the road, and then work backwards from that in understanding how you would then measure whether you've successfully accomplished that. And so, especially when it comes to product growth, oftentimes a very common measurement at a company level is to measure like, you know, the user base volume, (laughs) whether you're growing in your user base volume. And then from that company level, you know, success metric, usually a growth team would then break that down into acquisition and then engagement and retention, right? Because in order Mm -hmm. to drive up that volume of users, you want to make sure that you are acquiring new customers, but it's not good enough to just acquire them. You have to activate them to use your product. And then after you activate them, you want to keep them engaged. So then mm-hmm. there's um, different metrics for each one of those phases. So acquisition is usually sign up numbers, right? And then once you get to like the activation engagement part, it's more measuring frequency of use, like whether they're returning often enough. And depending on your product, 
the frequency could differ. Something social, such as you know Instagram or um, Facebook and, and so on, would probably be measuring more DAU because mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. um, they're expecting customers to come <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, versus there are other products that are more on a weekly or monthly basis, right? So, so that's um, the different. Uh, metrics for engagement. And then the last around retention is usually churn, trying to understand how many customers are stopping use of your product and whether that is at a healthy volume or not. And usually churn can be even broken down further into voluntary versus involuntary, meaning voluntary are customers choosing explicitly to stop using your product versus involuntary, especially for paid products, could be due to payment issues and something more systematically internally you could try to solve to prevent Mm -hmm. that kind of churn. Yeah. And do you have an example from your experience of like not setting the that vision and strategy and just going straight to the metrics resulting in uh, the wrong direction chosen? Yeah, there's definitely been times like that where top down, like executives have mm-hmm. some target goal in mind, right? And then there's misalignment on whether the team can come up with a roadmap to deliver those results because there wasn't alignment with leadership on what is the strategy and what is a realistic target based on that strategy, right? And so I always feel like um, that's the foundation to ensuring that the teams are set up for success in achieving OKRs and goals. Um, Mm -hmm. otherwise, you know, you would be given these arbitrary numbers and it's really hard to defend like, you know, why you cannot achieve them. And if you don't achieve them, it also is a morale hit for the team. So it's just not in a great situation if you don't do that upfront legwork of setting clear strategies. Because sometimes with a clear strategy, it also means you may not work on everything that would drive towards immediate results. Mm-hmm. And and that's okay. That means you are working ahead and thinking more long-term um, and that you need that space to, to make sure that to the earlier point with product-led growth, you do invest in things that will differentiate your offering and may not pay off in the near term, but it is the right thing to do in the long term. So that's where mm-hmm. strategy is very important, even ahead of setting your yeah. uh, OKRs. Sounds like we need another one of these on just stakeholder management, setting vision <laughs> and strategy, but we'll, we'll hold that in a, another time if folks are asking for it. Um, yeah. Moving to uh, Adriana's question on on data. So let's say we've set the direction, but how have you found your teams leveraging data in that decision making process and product growth? Yeah. So especially with product growth or growth teams in general, um, there's a general practice to do a lot of rapid. A B testing and measurement insights and mm-hmm. iteration. And so I would say data is key to all of that because the whole point is that you can quickly learn and make decisions based on the data you gather from those A B tests. Now, um, it, does that mean that you don't do anything without um, A-B testing? Not exactly, um, but it tends to be very heavy on the experimentation front. So that's why if you see a lot of PM roles that say it's growth, like Mm -hmm. there's expectation that you know a lot about experimentation. Um, And in terms of risk management, I would say based on my learnings during my Amazon days, there's a known term around one-way door versus two-way door decisions. Yeah. And you have to be very conscious of what is Can really... you give the audience um, a definition of that? I think it would be useful. <laughs> yeah. So a two-way door is 
essentially something that's reversible, meaning once you go in one way, you can always back out and then yeah. go the other way, right? Versus one way is like, once you go in, you can't easily come back out anymore. And I've heard this once from um, one of the VP leaders at Amazon, and he said that rarely in his career has he come across too many one-way door decisions. <laughs> so, and, and when it's a one, and when it's a two-way door decision, sure, you should understand what are the risks and try to mitigate as much as possible. But if you miss something, you don't have to sweat it. And so, <laughs> that's why because it's reversible, right? So, if there's something you missed and you find out after launch. You can always reverse things. And that's why it's called a two-way door. And the reason why Amazon came up with this is because there's a leadership principle about, about being biased for action so mm -hmm. that you don't spend too much time debating internally to reach consensus before taking action. Instead, if it's a two-way door decision, sure, have the discussion. But if there isn't consensus, still feel comfortable pushing things forward to action and then from the results determining next steps from there right versus if it's a one-way door decision you surely have to do your due diligence in advance to try to identify all potential risks by talking to all cross-functional partners really understanding what are the best actions to take and making that recommendation to all levels to make sure that they are fully bought in before you take the action. Uh, fully, fully aligned with that. And you mentioned um, A-B testing at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, so Diana has worked in uh, lots of really large companies uh, with a lot of data and a lot of users. Um, I have ex have experience in smaller ones. And sometimes it just doesn't make sense to run an A-B test because mm -hmm. the traffic isn't there. So yeah. you rely on a combination of data and instinct and rapid enough iteration that you can get to something that there's a pull from the user. So to me, it's combining those data insights with talking to customers where with effectively setting, as Diana mentioned before, those um, that vision and strategy and then getting into that supporting data and um, research insights. Yeah, yeah. fully aligned. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right. What is our next one? So our next um, question is from Masha. Hi, Masha. Uh, and hers is about the strategies for driving user engagement. Um, how can product managers ensure that users fully leverage the value and potential of the features that you put out there? Mm. So I think there's a few steps to that when yeah. you're trying to drive adoption of a new feature first is awareness you want to make sure that <laughs> your users are aware that the feature is even there um, and second is consideration so what how would you message and position that feature so that it resonates with the customer to the point where they would consider using it mm. right and that's where oftentimes pms do work with product marketing and marketing to ensure that there is the right messaging and positioning as a part of the go to market plan yeah and then conversion right so measuring okay out of those that are your target customers how many have you actually reached and then converted into using your product, you could see if that is on par with what you expected as a baseline or there's room for improvement and could always iterate on that, right? So there's organically how many people are just adopting your feature. Then you can leverage um, you know, marketing to nudge and push through more messaging, whether mm -hmm. it's through email channel or push notifications or in-app notifications to nudge more use of the feature. And then the last lever is always using some sort of incentive and carrot, right? <laughs> like you could always be like, oh, well, if you use this feature, you get, I don't know, 5% towards your next purchase or whatever as an incentive. And then you could always offer a stick depending on what it is that you want to do. Because um, I've 
been at many marketplaces where there's like sellers. And sometimes if you want to incentivize sellers to behave a certain way, it's not necessarily giving them a monetary incentive. Sometimes you have to give them some sort of stick, like, okay, Mm -hmm. you're going to be limited in how much you can sell on the site if you don't complete this action, right? And that's the way to motivate them to complete the task and adopt the feature. What do you think of those, uh, I'm breaking up with you emails? I feel like I've gotten a couple of like, if you don't talk to me in 30 days, you can't use our product. (laughs) Yeah, I I think that's like the last lever. Like I said, like you could either give a carrot or a stick. Like ideally you want customers to sincerely and voluntarily want to use your product and feature, right? And I also believe in... Um, because I've owned identity before at eBay, uh, account hygiene is also very important. And so, yeah, the breakup <laughs> emails are sort of a way to make sure that there's good account hygiene um, and the company doesn't store information of past customers needlessly if they're never planning to come back again. Exactly. Right? So, yeah, it's all it's yeah. not always about the bigger number. It's uh, about the people who are actually using using yeah. your product. Um, so let's just switch to the last um, focus for us, and that's building effective product teams. And so one of the questions from Natalia is um, just an overview of what is it? What is the day in the life of, in your experience? And I see someone who's then went into a more of a people management position to a business leader, GM type uh, role at the companies you've worked at. Mm-hmm. So I've myself transitioned from IC to manager many years ago, but I've also helped a lot of my directs in the past um, and those I've coached. Uh, transition from IC to people manager. And the thing that stood out to me the most that they say is when you shift from IC to people manager, you definitely feel a huge transition where you're working less day to day with your design and engineering counterparts in building the product. And it's more around setting strategy and um, managing relationships and people (laughs) and then setting processes. (laughs) So it's less about the product and more about like the people, I would say is is how they described it to me. Um, And then even as a people manager, as you move up in ranks, whether it's from director, like senior manager to director or director to VP and VP to CPO, what I've also heard there is that it's more and more about relationships and people and the business side of things and more and more removed from products, surprisingly, (laughs) Um, especially from, you know, CPOs that I've uh, interviewed and come across. Um, They tell me that, like, you know, because I've aspired to be a CPO one day. And, you know, Elena, you could probably speak to it since you are one yourself. Um, They they tell me that it, it is less about the act working on the actual product of course you still set the product vision and whatnot but most of your day-to-day is more understanding the business side of things and working with the rest of the c-suite on that um aspect and then the people and the org kind of challenges yeah i definitely agree with that assessment so relationships all the way um the other thing i've noticed is that difference between being right and being effective I think mm-hmm. as an IC, you're constantly evaluated for shipping. As you progress through your career, it's shipping the right things. Mm-hmm. And as you continue, it's shipping sort of the, the right things for the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and, con- and especially in larger companies, it's those relationships or the positioning or the, the negotiations a year before uh, a project launches to get the right resources that are critical for the success of, of something or even getting the funding, the investment in pursuing a topic. So I can definitely relate to everything you've said, that relationships, communication, that influence really become uh, a part of the a part of the day-to-day 
Although, you know, I'm still doing a lot of the, you know, the AI uh, model data matching and some of the thing, the more unsavory things day to day as well. So I don't I think that goes away. <laughs> um, and I think we have time for one more. And this one is from Philippe. And that's just about product rituals. What are, I don't know, you've worked internationally and you've set up um, these diverse, impactful teams. Are there things um, when you build out that culture that that resonate, that you've honed through your experience? Yeah, so I've worked with a lot of international teams and I myself had worked abroad before as well. So while working in the States, I've worked with distributed teams that are based in India or in Argentina and Europe and so on. Um, and then while working in Shanghai, China, I had also um, led multiple cross-functional teams, including product management. I wouldn't say the rituals changed that much across geos, it is more different across companies is what mm. I've more experienced. Like, for example, Amazon is more known for PMs writing press releases and FAQs as their primary artifact versus most companies I've been at, PMs produce product requirements documents or PRDs for short. <laughs> So mm -hmm. I think that's a major difference in the formatting, but the intent's the same thing, right? It's to articulate, you know, what is the product vision and the strategy and the requirements to go along with that of a particular initiative or feature. Um, but the format differs. And so some of those rituals also differ. And then just like, you know, some, you know, this is back in the days. Back in the days, there were still teams that still go with waterfall. And I believe I still hear certain industries are still waterfall rather than agile. So some of those rituals would also change from company to company as well. And less so about, you know, geo to geo, especially within the same company. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, I think the majority I've seen is also just company to company, the culture whether it's a uh, product focus or let's say sales focus, focus. whether it's a services company, um, uh, the size, so that the amount of time you spend um, is something, something that changes. I think what I find from a rituals perspective is having that, um, and it's a little cliche, but learning mindset, mm -hmm. because depending on where you are, that's something you have to continue to do. So right now, AI is the tool that everybody needs to use. Mm -hmm. But yesterday it was doing user research because there weren't user researchers on staff or adapting to a PRFAQ methodology because you joined a company. Uh, the company I was at was next door where, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's a different PRD, but it is it is different. And so quickly learning that, quickly learning the culture and what makes you successful, I think is uh, super, super critical, super important. Mm -hmm. Well. Thank you so much, Diana. I know we haven't gotten through everybody's questions. Um, we will take the time after this. Diana granted us a little bit more time to just um, answer a lot of you folks. And again, lean on each other. Um, there's a lot of professionals that can help. Thank you, Diana, um, for your time with us. Um, again, Diana is a product executive. She's also a career coach. So reach out. She'll uh, post an introduction and a way to do that uh, later on today. And come back and join us for the community all hands on August 9th. And join us for speaking with Karthaga, a CEO who's making generative AI and blockchain accessible on August 22nd as we continue some of these um, career learning webinars. Thank you, everyone. I look Bye. forward to answering more of the AMA. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Diana.